Hollywood queen Ava Gardner made an unforgettable impression on film with her stunning performances and captivating charm. But her final chapter was tarnished by loneliness and absence. Despite her fame and marriages to Mickey Rooney, Artie Shaw, and Frank Sinatra, none of her ex-husbands attended her burial, despite her global fandom. Gardner survived a troubled upbringing, Hollywood celebrity, and personal and professional changes. Despite health issues in her final years, her spirit and legacy live on. We'll explore Ava Gardner's intriguing, sometimes stormy life, including why her ex-husbands didn't attend her burial and her extraordinary strength and passion. Ava Gardner's Rural Upbringing Ava was born in 1922, and her early years were quite different from her later years as a Hollywood princess. Her family wasn't very wealthy. She was raised among her six siblings on a farm. They went to Virginia to start over because things became so bad that they could no longer afford to buy the property. Their new existence could have been better. However, the onset of the Great Depression was imminent. Gardner was barely 15 years old when her father died unexpectedly from bronchitis. Gardner was raised in a religious home, but she abandoned religion when the priest was unable to meet her father in his last moments. After that, they relocated back to North Carolina. After graduating from high school and enrolling in secretarial courses, Gardner started her employment there. Gardner's Path to Success Gardner came into acting by accident rather than by choice. It was on a trip to New York City when she was 18 that her brother-in-law professionally shot her. Upon hanging her image in his studio, several customers inquired about the girl's identity. Among those customers was Barnard Dewin, who claimed to be an MGM talent scout. Dewin was a legal clerk who pretended to be a scout to meet females, it came out. Although Dewin did not deceive the studio receptionist, Gardner's brother-in-law realized it may be a good idea to send her photos to MGM. The Audition Gardner ultimately received a screen test from the studio because of this, and she'd traveled to New York for it. Gardner's agency encouraged her not to talk because of her strong Southern accent. Despite her questionable acting abilities, Gardner signed a deal with MGM in 1941. She performed in over a dozen little parts that no one would recognize her in at first, including pinups and promotional pictures. Eventually, however, she worked with a speech coach and singing instructor supplied by MGM, which gave her the skills she needed to become a leading woman eventually. Meeting Mickey Rooney Mickey Rooney was one of the greatest stars in America when Ava Gardner was starting at MGM. When the young actor saw Ava Gardner on the set, he was 21. He showed an instant interest in her on her first day there. Initially, she refused to go with him since she was younger than Rooney, had just begun her career in Hollywood, and was much taller. It was difficult to resist a movie star, however. When they first met, he portrayed Brazilian dancer Carmen Miranda in drag, complete with false eyelashes, which surely caught her interest. Mickey Rooney courted her, but MGM got in the way. Indeed, Gardner and Rooney went on dates, and when he proposed to her, she initially objected, telling him that she preferred to wait until she was 19. MGM was also against Rooney and Gardner being together because Rooney portrayed boyish characters and it would have damaged his reputation on screen. His female fans would have been devastated to learn he was engaged. Nevertheless, MGM eventually catered to their star's desires, and when the couple wed, they made sure it was in Santa Barbara, away from the spotlight. The marriage was a rocky one. The star-crossed couple was beginning to experience some turbulence. Gardner wasn't a well-known actress yet, but her gorgeous appearance made her the ideal partner for Rooney. They were the most glamorous couple in public, but in private, they had their problems. Rooney's drinking became an issue, and Gardner later talked about how nasty he became when he was drunk. She wasn't an angel either. When Rooney got angry, she was known to make fun of him for being short. Gardner still struggled to get roles. It seems natural to assume that Gardner's stock at MGM would rise following her marriage to Rooney, who was essentially treated like royalty at the studio. However, she continued to receive minor roles. Of the 15 roles she completed with the studio during her career, MGM only gave her credit for one. It was a difficult period for Gardner, 
her career stagnated and her marriage was causing her anguish. Although she may not have had the degree of control she desired over her career, with the producers ultimately determining her fate, her marriage was something she could influence and she was about to make a significant decision. The Split Ava Gardner and Mickey Rooney were married briefly. They were married in 1942 and divorced in 1943. Although she remained silent in public to protect Rooney's reputation as the devout son of a judge, she dealt with grievous mental suffering and extreme mental cruelty during their marriage, according to the documents. And it was rumored he had affairs in addition to his gambling problem. She was awarded $25,000 as part of the settlement, covered her legal bills, and was relieved to leave the marriage. Gardner lost her mom the same day she separated from Rooney. As things were beginning to turn around for Gardner, she was leaving her toxic marriage, getting her contract with MGM renewed, and receiving a raise, she also had to deal with a devastating personal blow. On the day that she and Rooney officially separated, her mother, Mary Elizabeth, or Molly Gardner, passed away from uterine cancer after a protracted illness. Tragically, this meant that Mary Elizabeth Molly Gardner would never get to witness her youngest child, Ava, go on to become one of the most well-known movie stars in the world. The divorce and her mother's passing were a stark reminder that Gardner was on her own in the movie business. Meeting Howard Hughes Many famous men courted Ava Gardner, but few were as renowned as Howard Hughes. He met her before she was single, when her mother was still alive, and the family needed financial assistance to pay for numerous medical bills. It was a golden age for Hughes, who took time from his other business endeavors to make movies in Hollywood and romance starlets. Although he asked her for her hand in marriage, she declined, having learned her lesson from marrying Rooney. She and Hughes maintained an on-and-off closeness for decades, though she described him as painfully shy, completely enigmatic, and more eccentric, greater than any person she had ever encountered. Husband number two. After her divorce, Gardner did not waste time finding a new partner. When they married, she and Rooney were too young and inexperienced, but she was determined to try again, this time with a more experienced partner, the band leader and jazz musician Artie Shaw. Although she and Rooney were only a few years apart, Artie Shaw was over a decade older than her, and his masculinity and intelligence made him the perfect match for Gardner. The only problem is that Shaw was already married when he and Gardner started dating. Shaw left his wife for Gardner, but they were married in 1945. More Marriage Woes Despite her high expectations, Gardner's marriage to Shaw was just as troubled as her first, and despite their apparent differences, the two shared many commonalities in their treatment of women. Later in life, Gardner spoke out about the emotional abuse she suffered at the hands of Shaw, a sentiment that was also expressed by Lana Turner, another of Shaw's ex-wives. This hurt Gardner, who was still a young professional making her way in the world. In addition, she was insecure in the relationship because Shaw and his friends were intellectuals and she felt unworthy of them. She even claimed that the only books she'd ever read were the Bible and Gone with the Wind. Gardner made an effort. Gardner was mistreated by Shaw, which is unacceptable, but in a way their relationship helped her to educate herself. She took a serious interest in reading and stopped acting to attend classes at the University of California. Although education is always beneficial, Gardner was going through an intricate mental phase at the time, believing she would never measure up to Shaw and his colleagues, no matter how hard she tried. Gardner took to drinking. When Ava Gardner married Mickey Rooney, she developed a drinking habit. Being underage meant that she had to sneak out, and the two encouraged each other's habits. But it never got out of control. However, when she was with Shaw and old enough to stop hiding her drinking, the drinking started to get serious. Gardner experienced periods of great depression and was frequently hung over in her second marriage. Shaw, being the intelligent man that he was, would resort to psychoanalysis. So to address the issues in their marriage, he would send his wife to a therapist. However, this was not enough to resolve their problems. Split number two. Gardner was infatuated with Shaw, despite his mistreatment, for reasons only the heart can fathom. She never had the strength to end her second marriage in the same way that she finished her first, 
And although she knew they wouldn't last as a couple, she considered having a child as a means of preserving their union. Shaw, however, saw through Gardner's delusions and ended their marriage after just one year and one week of marriage when he handed her the divorce papers. Shaw's sixth marriage was a slap in the face to Gardner. Following Gardner, Shaw began dating Kathleen Windsor, an author. The two were married in 1946. Windsor was well known for her first book, Forever Amber, which was released in 1944 and sparked controversy due to its explicit sexual content, leading to its prohibition in 14 states because it was pornographic. Shaw and Windsor were a major pair, but their relationship was a slap in the face to Gardner because Gardner had read Forever Amber after it was published, and Shaw had abused her for reading such a trashy novel. Maybe Gardner was satisfied to hear that Windsor would marry her lawyer and Shaw would end their relationship. Gardner finally catches a break with the killers. Ava Gardner's early years were difficult due to her abusive relationships and the poor quality of the role she was getting. But she finally made it big when director Rob Sidemark saw her and thought that she'd be an ideal for the femme fatale in his noir film, The Killers. Originally based on an Ernest Hemingway short story, the film was a huge hit, winning multiple awards and becoming a genre classic. Almost overnight, Ava Gardner went from being a relatively unknown actress, whose only claim to fame was the famous men she was associated with, to becoming a renowned actress. With the spotlight comes the negative press. Ava Gardner had been pursuing fame, but once she achieved it, she discovered the dark side of it. Tabloids gave her a bad reputation, pointing out that the 23-year-old had already experienced two divorces. With her romantic past and prominent role as a femme fatale, they painted Ava Gardner as a woman with low morals who could be found with a different man every night. However, Gardner claims that reality tells a very different story. She rarely went out and spent most of her time alone at home night after night. Moreover, we can now see that, although her first two marriages were difficult and mistakes, they were by no means blots on her character, as many believed at the time. Work picks up for Gardner Following the killers, Gardner's career took off, and in 1951 she was finally given some leading roles by MGM, including the musical Showboat, for which she was paid $140,000 to star. Although Gardner had taken singing lessons years earlier, the film's preview screenings didn't go well for her vocal performance, so MGM had singer Annette Warren subtly replace Gardner's voice. Her actual voice can still be heard on the soundtrack for which she received royalties, and some people even still think that Gardner's voice is superior. Ava Gardner's True Love When Ava Gardner first met Frank Sinatra, she was a young, unknown wannabe actress, and he was one of the most famous faces in America. Their paths would cross again after about 10 years, but this time Gardner was a true star and Sinatra's fame was beginning to fade. Fading or not, Gardner was mad about Sinatra, and unlike when they first met, he noticed her too. The obstacle to their love was that Sinatra was married and had a child with Nancy Barbato, his first wife. Sinatra tells his wife, It took some time for Sinatra and Barbato's separation to be finalized because they were Catholic. At the time, Gardner was making a movie in Spain, and Sinatra came to visit her. That's when she learned about Sinatra's jealous tendencies. She admitted to spending the night with a bullfighter, and Sinatra, not living up to his promise, was furious at the revelation. Gardner made Sinatra prove that he was getting separated. How much can you trust a man who has affairs in the first place? Gardner knew that Sinatra might not be the most truthful of men regarding matters of love, so she insisted that he obtain evidence that his marriage was truly ending. They drove to Sinatra's house, where his wife was, and Sinatra said through the buzzer, Nancy, will you please tell Ava that I've asked for a divorce? It was a ridiculous moment, but it set up their marriage, which would be so intense and passionate that it would make all the others seem trite. Gardner's Thing for Married Men Gardner seemed to have a thing for married men. Apart from Sinatra and Shaw, she also dated Fred McMurray, her co-star in Singapore, just before she met Sinatra. She didn't mind being with a married man, but she had her boundaries, and she couldn't stand it when she found out that McMurray's wife was ill. She also had an affair with Robert Taylor, who was married to Barbara Stanwyck, 
but it was kept a very secret because the risk of Taylor cheating on Stanwyck was too great. She also had a brief affair with Howard Duff just before he and Ida Lupino got hitched. Gardner's Fling with Robert Mitchum Ava Gardner was honest with Robert Mitchum about her affair with Sinatra, and he was not happy to hear about it, not out of jealousy, but rather because of what Sinatra might do if he found out. Get into a fight with him, Sinatra, and he won't stop until one of you is dead, he said, signaling the end of their affair. Robert Mitchum was an icon of classic Hollywood, known for starring in films like Out of the Past. Additionally, he was one of the famous men Ava Gardner got to know intimately. One marriage ends, another begins. After much legal wrangling, Sinatra and Gardner's marriage finally became official in 1951. And after just 10 days of blissful bliss, the press celebrated the long-awaited union by turning it into a major scandal that shaped public perceptions of the two celebrities. The press had already painted Gardner as a femme fatale, emulating the character from her breakthrough role, and now they had even more fuel to burn as Gardner broke up Sinatra's family. Furthermore, Sinatra faced criticism for leaving his family from the public, the press, and even the Catholic Church. Sinatra was going through a rough phase. At that point in his career, it was confirmed that he had to use his famous wife to get parts, but it was still a difficult time for him because of how low public opinion, his stalling career, and rumors that he had mob connections. The worst part of it all was that he was broke. Fortunately, his wife was in high spirits and supported him, even buying him a ticket to see her in Africa when she was filming Magambo in 1963 because he couldn't afford it. She also helped him land roles by using her influence. Gardner was the one who pushed to get Sinatra cast in From Here to Eternity, which helped him win an Oscar. Considering the public's perception of Sinatra, it's difficult to believe that he had to rely on her fame to get parts. Fear of a Communist Couple It's no surprise that rumors about celebrities circulate, and the notion that Gardner was a femme fatale who ended Sinatra's marriage was even more scandalous in those days than it is now. Another aspect of celebrity life in those days was the constant fear of being labeled as a communist. Gardner and Sinatra worried that they would be reported to Senator McCarthy's House of Un-American Activities because Hedda Hopper, the gossip journalist who covered their relationship, was exposing celebrities for their communist sympathies, and they could have been targets. Both Gardner and Sinatra supported Democrats, and Sinatra even actively campaigned for them, and they both vehemently opposed racism. Artie Shaw had several communist friends with whom Gardner interacted as well. MGM forced Gardner to abort. Despite her three marriages, Ava Gardner never had children. This wasn't because she didn't want children or wasn't physically able to have children. Instead, MGM made an effort to control its stars' bodies so that none of their leading ladies would become pregnant. When Gardner married Sinatra, she became pregnant twice and had to have abortions both times. MGM had all sorts of penalty clauses about their stars having babies, Gardner said in a memoir. Her spouse was devastated by the abortions. While pregnant women may now be hidden with a variety of visual effects, in the past there were fewer options. Even still, the fact that these studios coerced actresses into having abortions is quite unsettling. Magambo was a nightmare to shoot. Most film shootings go rather quickly, but sometimes there's a catastrophe when things don't go as planned and there are conflicts amongst influential people. For Magambo, it was the situation. She had issues with Sinatra going into the shoot, and the shoot itself brought its own set of problems. Under the direction of the renowned director John Ford, he was forced to cast Gardner instead of Maureen O'Hara, which created an awkward atmosphere as he vented to her. Gardner's buddy, Clark Gable, was co-starring, and Gable was unhappy with how his co-star was being handled. This impacted his mood, and the set was not the most pleasant because of the terrible attitudes of the director and the two stars. Cooling off at the end of the day. Shot in several African locations, Mugambo's sweltering climate took a toll on everyone. The cast and crew would be covered in perspiration at the end of the day, and Ava Gardner's favorite method to decompress and unwind was bathing. Her canvas tub, which she would take public baths in, after having one of the local guys fill it, didn't sit well with the ruling British colonial authority, 
They were unhappy that Gardner would bathe in public since they valued modesty highly. She continued taking her protest baths outside in the open, ignoring their objections. Gardner was confident in one thing. She refused to listen to advice from others. Gardner and the Elephant The sequence in Magambo when Gardner gets pushed by the young elephant and ends up in a mud pool stands out. It turns out that the elephant's misbehavior was the reason for this, and it was not pre-planned. Gardner was not pleased with herself when she fell, even if it looked fantastic on the screen. Gardner called for assistance, hoping a few crew members would rush to her aid. John Ford, the director, instructed the crew to disregard Gardner's cries for help because he was intent on tormenting her. Even with its brutality, it was a compelling film, so maybe Ford's insanity had a purpose. Gardner gets an Oscar nomination, but loses her husband. It wasn't an easy shoot for Magambo. At one point, Gardner was transferred to England to recuperate from dysentery. Nevertheless, her hardships paid off when she was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Actress. Although she lost to Audrey Hepburn, it was a great pleasure to be recognized for her performance rather than her appearance or romantic connections. It was her lone Oscar nomination in her entire career. While her professional life was flourishing, her marriage was not doing so well. She and Sinatra encouraged each other's alcoholism, and they often got into fights in public while intoxicated. Even though the divorce wasn't formalized for several years, they ended their marriage in 1953, having only been together for two years. Gardner and Sinatra's Wild Times Few people have ever learned about the numerous crazy adventures that Ava Gardner and Frank Sinatra had together during their relationship. One was the time they were imprisoned for driving about intoxicated in the middle of the night, firing 38 caliber weapons, and breaking storefront windows. They were forced to provide a $20,000 bribe to prevent the news from being revealed. Given their exploits, it's no surprise that they remained close throughout the years. Even after their marriage failed, he was said to have called her three times a week. This is the guy who, following their breakup, conducted relationships to arouse Gardner's suspicions. Gardner said he was the love of her life, and while their relationship was complex and sometimes tumultuous, it was evident for both of them that they were in a truly romantic connection. He needed her more. As stated by Sinatra scholar J. Randy Tabarelli, one of the factors that constantly caused tension in the star's relationship was Sinatra's increased emotional and financial dependence on Gardner, which led to dangerously excessive acts of jealousy. Tabarelli's biography of Sinatra claims that the singer made many attempts at suicide, or at least a faint at it, because of his wife. After an intense altercation, Ava met her ex-husband, Artie Shaw, in the first instance. When Sinatra phoned Ava back to their hotel, he was putting bullets into his mattress, but he was pretending to end his life over the phone. Another time, following a disagreement that drove Ava scurrying from their Lake Tahoe vacation, Sinatra overindulged in sleeping pills. Gardner and Hemingway Ernest Hemingway might be included if Rooney, Shaw, Sinatra, Hughes, and Gable weren't enough for you. Following their breakup, she and Sinatra remained close friends. Through Hemingway, Gardner became interested in bullfighting. She traveled with him to Spain and stayed at his property in Cuba, where she's renowned for swimming naked in his pool. Hemingway then said, the water is not to be emptied. After Hemingway introduced her to one of the most well-known bullfighters in the world, Luis Miguel Dominguez, she decided to give it another go. She had an affair with a bullfighter once before. The two became ardent lovers. Their arguments were as fierce as their kissing. She was the prettiest and the most fierce. I had a very fierce wolf in a cage, he said about Gardner. The Statue of the Barefoot Contessa While Ava Gardner and Frank Sinatra were still married, she acted in the 1954 movie The Barefoot Contessa. Not only does Sinatra have something to remember from the Joseph L. Mankiewicz picture, but it's also regarded as one of her best. He received a statue of Gardner from the studio, which he placed in his yard. Gardner appeared in the movie. Years after the two separated up, the monument remained in his yard, but ultimately the moment arrived to remove it. In 1976, Sinatra wed his fourth and last wife. She objected to her husband's keeping a statue of his former spouse in his garden, so he was forced to remove it. 
more success, and more abusive men. In 1959, Gardner wrapped up her 20-year contract and acted in the post-apocalyptic movie On the Beach. Although it brought Gardner even more notoriety, it caused filmmaker Stanley Kramer trouble since people would swarm the beach during production to get a peek at Gardner. Her next primary job was co-starring with John C. Scott in The Bible in the Beginning. During the filming, despite his marriage, he had an affair with someone else, but Scott was aggressive and had some severe problems. At one time, he even kicked down her hotel room door. Director John Huston needed to use local mafia members to shield Gardner from Scott's unsettling actions. An Aging Actress Though it's not one of Gardner's best movies, she gave it her all in the 1970s, demanding that she do all the stunts herself in one of her most significant parts. Though many felt her star power was fading, this was still an outstanding feat. Many even said that she was too elderly for Charlton Heston, her co-star. Considering how close in age they were, this was rather offensive. Her body was beginning to feel the effects of aging in addition to her work. In 1968, she chose to get a hysterectomy because she didn't want to suffer from uterine cancer as her mother had. She had no idea that she would suffer from a host of other health issues. She suffered from pneumonia, lupus, and heavy smoking. When she had a stroke in 1986 that left her largely paraplegic, things started to go south. Telling her story Following her stroke, Gardner was in the wrong place and even admitted to Mickey Rooney that she was considering suicide. After deciding to share her life story, she engaged Peter Evans to ghostwrite her book at this period. They never finished the project because Gardner lost interest after learning that Evans had written that Frank Sinatra was connected to the mafia. Nevertheless, Evans' notes, including many delicious anecdotes, were made public after Gardner's passing. Among these tales was her union with Sinatra. She once heard a gunshot coming from the living room when she woke up in the middle of the night after they were married. Given his previous threats, she believed her husband had taken his own life. Upon entering the room, she saw that her spouse had just fired through a cushion and was idly chuckling. Gardner meets her end. Although Ava Gardner had an opulent existence, her latter years were everything. In her later years, she lived a solitary life in a London flat with a dog and a staff to look after her. Gardner had been on the floor for hours after collapsing, and the housekeeper discovered her there one day when she returned home. She exhaled her last breath and muttered, I'm so tired. Gardner, who was 67 years old, died from pneumonia. She had just a few weeks to go until she was scheduled to meet an American doctor Sinatra had recommended to her, one who may be able to aid in her stroke recovery. We may never know, but maybe the doctor could have rescued her. Regrets Undoubtedly, Ava Gardner had a whole life, but in her last moments, she expressed remorse in a few words. It's a shocking statement from a woman who defied expectations and rejected the roles society had traditionally demanded of women. Despite all the glory to her name, the attention she commanded, the men she loved and who loved her back, the money she made and the acclaim she received, it seemed that when she was sad and lonely in the end, she wished she had a family. I'm sorry I spent 25 years making films. I wish now I had the things most important to a woman, a good marriage, children, a better education, she said. Paying tribute to Gardner. Ava Gardner was buried at Sunset Memorial Park alongside her parents and siblings. The Ava Gardner Museum opened in 1996 in the same town as the actress. Today, we look back on the star who dazzled on screen in many classic movies and whose life was as full of love, drama, triumph, and tragedy as any of her films were. Gardner had a lot of love in her life, and with that love came a lot of loss. For whatever reason, none of her ex-husbands attended her funeral, though Tina, Sinatra's daughter, said that Frank never got over her death. If you've watched the video till here, that means you've enjoyed the video. Subscribe! Don't forget to turn on the notifications bell icon 